Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Uh, Wikibon I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Kelly. You can check out uh, his work at uh, Wikibon.org slash big data. He is the primary principal big data analyst at Wikibon. Has written a lot about this topic, a lot about visualization, and uh, has just put out a new study in the whole SQL, Hadoop, NoSQL rather, marketplace, so check that out. Uh, we're here at the Tableau Customer Conference. We're at the nation's capital. Philip Kim is here, he's the uh, marketing operations leader at GE uh, in the measurement and control side of the business. Philip, welcome to theCUBE, thanks very much for coming thank on. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at GE. Obviously, sure. big complex company, we're talking off camera, uh, we were covering the industrial internet announcement. Right. You guys are an enormous conglomerate, so where do you fit into the whole thing? Right, so we, uh, we're in a division of General Electric that specializes in what we call measurement and control, or the industrial health care. So a lot of the customers' assets that we monitor are the assets that power the economy. So power transmission lines, oil and gas pipelines, uh, things that really are very vital to the infrastructure of the United States or the countries around the world. We provide equipment and services and software that helps monitor that. Okay, so where does the data piece fit in and wh what's your role in all of this? So uh, we, we collect a lot of data from a variety of different sources, uh, including, as you mentioned before, the industrial internet where we're trying to figure out how do we get predictivity into the, uh, the intelligence of our uh, software and systems. The group that my team uh, is, is a part of is really around the commercial intelligence. How do we identify growth areas using the data sets that we have available? How do we identify where the cost uh, you know, savings can come from a customer's perspective. And we work with and collaborate with a large cross-functional group to take very large disparate data sets and boil it down to a, a single visualization that might help answer a very important question. So um, am I correct, you're looking for both market opportunities and cost saving yes. opportunities? Yes, absolutely, and as well as productivity. So you know, how do we make things a little fast, a little easier for the customer, how do we simplify things? So we will work with uh, quality organizations within our own business, we'll work with customer and sales and marketing representatives, uh, we'll work with anyone basically who has a compelling question that data could help answer. So you've been working with data for quite, a, quite some time, I, I would imagine. Yeah. So the, this big data meme must be kind of tongue in cheek to you, like big data, <laughs> big deal. I've been working with data for a long time. But, but what's different now about this whole you know, data discussion? What has changed? Is it, just the, is it the volume of data? Is it the power of data? Is, the, is it the economic value of data? Uh, I don't think there's any one answer, but I think that's a great example of how many things can contribute to why it's the right time for big data. Uh, I do believe that the democratization of, of this accessibility to data is a, is a major driving factor. Uh, tools like Tableau uh, are a fundamental piece of making it easy enough for a user to interact with a very large data set. Uh, and I think also it's because the business has, has started to recognize that there's a lot of value that can be retrieved if you know how to get it right in the right structure. So, uh, so Stephen, you mentioned you know being able to uh, sorry, Phil, being able to bring together a lot of different disparate data sets yeah. uh, and kind of do distill it down to one visualization right. and really start to make sense of that data. Right. Now, if, if you take that in a in a more traditional scenario, that would yeah. take months uh, to put together a data yeah. warehouse. You would uh, have IT right. uh, build uh, maybe an applica dashboarding application. Right eventually roll that out to your end users. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, as you just said, yeah. tools like Tableau, democratizing data, making right. that process a little bit easier sure. so that you can actually uh, get value from that data while it's right. still fresh, while it's still, um, you know, the insights will actually allow you to take some action uh, yeah. and, and monetize that data or, or drive other value. That's a great question. Uh, I think the first thing I would say is IT is actually part of our extended broad team. Uh, so we're partnered with them on, on this type of effort. What we can do though is we can kind of be on the leading edge, the prototyping uh, innovation investigation stage, and when it's ready, the IT team actually has a built-in template to do a much more comprehensive rollout. But uh, what it allows us to do is we don't have to go to the IT team and bother them with you know, very, very quick iterative prototyping stuff that may not pan out to be quite honest. And so what we can then do is use our, really our innovation to find those, those patterns, find those distinctive you know, I would say applications of that, 
And then once they've been proven out, we can then apply that back. And actually, our IT department uses Tableau to productionize it and put it onto the Tableau server and make it available to the rest of the organization as a whole. So we're really more of the prototyping agile development stage, and then we transfer that ownership back over to the IT mm -hmm. department as well. So it works both ways. Well, that's interesting because I, I've been to this conference before, and a few years back there was some, there's, uh, what you heard from IT was a bit of pushback from yeah. what Tableau was doing because yeah. uh, maybe, uh, you know, a few years back they didn't have as many of the enterprise grade controls around yeah. governance and security. Uh, it seems like Tableau has come a long way in terms of adding those types of capabilities, and IT is actually starting to embrace the tool. And in fact, right. as you mentioned, actually GE actually using it themselves. Yep. Well, I, I think that's uh, another great example of, of the adoption curve that you typically see with high technology products. I think it was initially designed for people like myself and my team, uh, but then over time, obviously as the product has matured, it's become much more accessible to a larger group of, of, of folks. And I think on top of that, uh, the business need has been really championed by uh, executives have seen the value uh, of doing this in this way. Mm -hmm. So by partnering with IT, we can get more done. We can scale. And in an organization like General Electric, uh, we have to be able to scale to have some sort of value. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about the, some of the organizational issues that sure. you've faced. Um, you mentioned that IT now is embracing tools like Tableau, but initially there might have been some, some tension. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if you could talk about that dynamic, and as well, you know, from yeah. the users that you service. Yeah. Um, how did you drive adoption? How, what about training? Things of that nature. Start with, sure. um, start with the organizational you know, tension and how you got through all that. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's a great question. It may not necessarily be uh, as applicable to us. We actually had a tremendous buy-in from the IT organization. So we didn't actually have any uh, pushback uh, of, of this tool per se. It was a love-love relationship. It was a love-love relationship. <laughs> uh, it was much more about the fact that we had a blank slate. We were starting literally from ground zero. And so we sat down together as a team and said, what is the good use of this you know, amazing technology that uh, would potentially drive significant value for, for our organization? And so what we wanted to do is focus on what would, it, what would we want to do with this technology? What would we want to do with this relationship? And we said, well, we want to help grow, you know, obviously the, the sales of our company, uh, which is really driven by you know, adding value to the customer. Uh, we want to make sure that we save valuable time because obviously everyone's time is limited. And so we're very focused on how do we make a day-to-day -day, uh, life for a person using Tableau much better? You know, how do we make their day a little bit less intrusive, a little less difficult, more ch less challenging? And then we also wanted to figure out, okay, well, there's a lot of stuff that we don't understand yet. We're going to be very quickly prototyping and iterating. What environment lets us do that? And so we sat down with IT as a partner and we figured out this is actually a pretty good solution set for the, what we're looking to do with it. Uh, so that the small team that we had with, within my, my group and, and IT was actually a love-love. We focused very heavily on, on the core things that were important to us. And then what we ended up doing was setting up these core pillars of, of our strategy and then communicating it across General Electric was really you know, the incremental step that you might see in terms of organizational change of behavior. Philip, can you talk about the, the different textures uh, of data, the, the diversity yeah. of, of data, the data sources? Did, did you have to um, think through uh, that from an architecture standpoint? Yeah. Uh, do you have a data architecture? I wonder <laughs> if you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, I think everyone's data architecture, uh, you might have alluded to it, I think, or Jeff, you might have alluded to it, is largely based on Excel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there yeah. is no real data architecture that I've seen, even with big data. Uh, that hasn't been fragmented. And I think what we are conscious about that is we're never going to be able to stop uh, fragmentation of data sets. What we have to be able to do is figure out how do we intelligently process what's important to us. Uh, data warehousing, BI will continue to evolve. Uh, we'll never stay ahead of that curve if we want to deliver value. So what we want to do is focus on, uh, instead of the data first, we'll focus on a question. And so our approach is very simple. Before we do any kind of analysis, uh, we ask, what's the question you're trying to answer? What's the answer look like, relatively speaking? And what's the benefit? That is, if I do a question, I give you the answer, what are you going to do with this that's going to make a difference? So our question answer benefit structure is really one of our fundamental pieces that we use whenever we get into any kind of project. And then what we might find out very quickly is that there is no data, there is no architecture, and therefore we might not be ready to try to answer this question yet, but there are other ones that might be much more valuable that it may be uh, a little orthogonal. So that's interesting, so I have to ask you, so a lot of data practitioners will tell us that 
a lot of times you don't know what questions you want to ask sure. until you see the data. Yeah. So what, what's your philosophy or maybe even recommendation <laughs> for fellow practitioners? Um, when you don't have uh, when, when you don't have all the, the, the right. questions, and you right. look at the data and you say, oh yeah. wow, it would be great to know this or yeah. that or that, should you go after that, or should you rather focus on the corpus of data that you have and extract value from that? Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't think there's any one way that works for everyone. Uh, what we've done successfully is use expert round table opinion. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have a brainstorming yeah. session and we'll say, hey, before we get into the actual tactics of deciding to go one path or the other, let's first figure out, give us everything you think would potentially be good questions, good answers. So kind of a wish benefit, list. Wish list, yeah. and just walk it down. And when we finish, then after about five, 10 minutes, you start realizing the run out of ideas. So you got <laughs> a, a quick snapshot. You take these ideas and you basically figure out what's the impact and what's the feasibility which I think is a correlation to how good your data sets might be, whether you can investigate and so forth. And what we'll do is we'll structure that to figure out the top two or three that we can answer in a very short time frame, two to three weeks. And using that, we'll get a pipeline of ideas that we know we can go after, and we might have a very strategic question to answer uh, that is very hard to answer, and we might just have a spike where we'll say, figure something out. But we might have other very specific deliverables to say, give me this view, because this view will translate to this type of you know, financial forecast or this type of, of, of campaign strategy. So it's a very pragmatic and practical prioritization. That's, yeah. a, that's some alliteration yeah. for you, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> uh, exercise that you go yes. through, uh, pick off the, the ones that are easier to do and can drive value, and then right. if you've got something that's more strategic, you got to make a business case, maybe right. get an investment, maybe find new data sources. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and, and we, we try to keep that discussion as minimize as possible. The reason why is we, we don't want to spend too much time talking amongst yourselves. In GE, meetings can spill over into other meetings, which I think is true of any large organization. So what we want to do is in, in a core stakeholder room, decide what those top 18, 20 might be, figure the top three or four that may, will make a difference in a very short time frame, and then focus that on. And what we'll do is we'll bring in data, we'll bring in the BI folks, we'll bring in the IT folks, we'll bring in Tableau, and we'll see if we can make sense of that. But we'll find our sweet spot, and we focus on those. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the Tableau piece, Jeff. Yeah, uh, so you know, we hear a lot from Tableau that sure. their, their goal really is to unlock the, you know, the power of data yeah. for, the, for the average business user. Sure. For somebody who's not a data scientist, doesn't have a lot of yeah. training in uh, statistics and other kind of disciplines around manipulating data. Yep. So uh, I, just from your, your experience with your team, yeah. how easy is it? is it? Is it as easy as dragging some data sources into a field and voila, you've got some visualizations? Or does it require some yeah. level of training despite the self-service right. moniker? Well, I, I think I, I can best answer your question by uh, giving the example uh, that what we've done in our team is, is help lead a larger organization within the business that isn't trained in statistics and they're actually becoming the power users that are actually deriving, uh, uh, drive, actually driving a lot of the value that we're seeing in some of the projects. So the projects that we've talked about in my organization, uh, fully 50, 60, 70% or more are now being driven by non-scientists, non-statisticians, non people who are not you know, in that big data space. So I think that answers your question. Um, but certainly, you know, it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. I think they always are trying to get better at it but it makes it easy enough where they can get to that level. So take us back to when you brought in a Tableau. What were the, what were the drivers? What did the environment look like before and, and after? Right, so the reason why we, we brought in uh, a Tableau and, and used, um, used it as a platform for us to do our analytics was that we were spending too much time with the final end product, which what the, the users cared about. We were spending far too much time on the data side, which didn't translate enough in benefit. We would spend so much time on a, on a data mining project that we couldn't have a product at the end of the day. And what we wanted to do was, was have a template, a factory, that we could use to drive uh, data uh, mining. And so Tableau fit that very well for us. And uh, without a lot of training and a lot of the, f the factory, uh, sorry, the templates that were existing in Tableau today, we could stitch together different data sets, do the blending in or outside of Tableau, but ultimately end up with a, a fairly well-finished product uh, with a lot of the interactivity built into it very quickly. So, am I, am I to understand you were just spending too much time cleaning data or interpreting data? Or I think getting a handle on it. Uh, which, which was, uh, I think, the first step. What do step. we have? <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> uh, that's always the first challenge of any data mining project is you're confronted with something entirely new. Um, it's not something that has already been cleaned up in stage. It's a new problem, new question statement. So now the question is, well, how do you get your hands around it? 
And Tableau is wonderful for taking in large, disparate, complex data set, and then you could just start playing around until you start seeing something that might be interesting. Uh, I think that's the first step to exploring the data set, but we, we typically have that question with that exploration kind of dovetailed in. But it, it's, a, it's a really intuitive environment for doing data mining. Yeah. Did you have to set up any kind of particular, again, the organizational question, any particular training regimen for your users, or how did you handle all the knowledge transfer there? Uh, actually, Tableau came in and, and held our first training session for us. Uh, we had some really great help uh, from our account rep, and uh, on top of that, I think uh, there's a tremendous community uh, of Tableau uh, users. I think that, that's one of the selling points, is that if you have a question and you don't quite know how to do something, you can actually go online and find it in one of the boards pretty easily. Mm. Uh, uh, Philip, kind of even taking a step back from that, yeah. talk a little bit about the, your employees, or your, your, your team, and the idea of being data-driven. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of is beyond just the tool you're using. It's a, it's yeah. a mindset, right? Yeah. Um, how did you, uh, how do you uh, kind of instill that kind of mindset? Uh, do you look for certain uh, characteristics when you're hiring? Mm -hmm. um, was it a, you know, we, we hear in some organizations are starting to adopt business yeah. intelligence and uh, yeah. data visualization technologies that it's like pulling teeth to get people to do things <laughs> in a new way. Um, <laughs> because you know, it's, it's, it's scary, Ch change yeah. can be scary. Yeah. Um, and doing things when you've done it kind of intuitively for so many years, sometimes when you're looking at data-driven methods, it can, it can be a little bit uh, uh, of a challenge to get people to adopt that style of decision making. Mm -hmm. Did you have that challenge, and how do you go about uh, kind of instilling that, that uh, mindset in, in your team? Well, I, th I think we have one advantage in General Electric is that we are a, a very data-driven company, and uh, we have Six Sigma as the backbone of a lot of uh, the core of, of, you know, all the executives, all the leaders are, have been fully well trained on it, including uh, all the, uh, the green belts, the people who just have a very solid understanding uh, of, of data. And I think what we wanted to do was, you know, how do we take that to the next step? How do we actually translate this, this core skill set into something even more powerful? And uh, initially that, that, that transition point um, required leadership. It took the buy-in of, of our CEO and President uh, Brian Palmer, our marketing, uh, chief marketing officer, uh, uh, as well as a number of folks who you know, saw the potential of it. And I think they gave us the, the room to experiment, to try out this idea with some key stakeholders. Uh, and then I think success breeds success in that we had been successful with a few projects and then suddenly more and more people realized, wow, this is uh, a very quick way, uh, it's a non-bureaucratic way, it's mm -hmm. a very organizationally simple way to get something done that they might not be able to do in the past or might be a little faster, mm -hmm. getting more data. I, people, I think, welcome good data uh, to make their decision. And so as long as you get to that level, I think you're, that's what you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. Philip, any big surprises um, from your experience <laughs> in, in, in bringing in ta Tableau and this whole journey that you've been on? What surprised you the most? I, I think the, the hardest thing for anyone to get into in this field is you've got to have, I think as uh, Jeff alluded to, you've got to have a passion for it. Uh, so we like surprises. Uh, we like to aim for surprise. And if we're not surprised, then we're probably not pushing ourselves too hard. So every day for us is a little bit of a surprise where the data says something that we didn't entirely anticipate. Um, we might have found you know, certain key indicators that are a good predictive performance of our, of our economy and of our business. Uh, we might find that there are hidden opportunities where you know, things that are driving up costs for us are driving up costs for our customers. And we find those things and, and raise those. And, and do people, they didn't believe you at first, I would imagine, <laughs> right? You had to win <laughs> them over, right? I mean, you have Nate Silver on later. <laughs> and of course, you know the story with him. There's a lot yeah. of controversy, right? People feel like he was biased yeah. or whatever it is, but, but the data you know, ultimately never lies if you yeah. can interpret corre yeah. it correctly. So did you get a lot of, of, of initial skepticism, like well, maybe there's a bias in the data, or for somebody that maybe the business decision wouldn't favor their <laughs> agenda, it would, it would try, to, try to discredit the methodology, or did you get any of that, or, or, and how did you deal with it? Uh, absolutely, and I think that's true of any organization where the first thing that people ask is, well, how did you get to this conclusion? What's your basis for this? And our business is fairly complicated, yeah. and so what we wanted to do very closely with our partners across our organization is, is help validate that what we did made sense. Uh, so we worked very closely with our internal stakeholders. Uh, we have tremendous people, tremendous experts in the business and in the, uh, the industry, 
and they could help validate what that was. So that was the first hurdle, that we wanted to get the experts and the industry uh, folks that we have within our own business saying, that kind of makes sense. Uh, they helped write us the stories that we would want to satisfy. That, that was a big lever that we had to, uh, to use to get adoption. The second, I think, is you know, how do you get people to act on it? And that's the, the benefit side, right. that uh, when we structured this project, we said, we asked for the question, we asked for the answer, and then we said, what, what would you do with this? What's the benefit if we do this? So we kind of had a foregone conclusion that if we did one, two, and th that we'd get three. And so that was one of our, uh, our little tricks that we had was we said, we, before we get started on this, what is the really, what if I do this? What will be the difference? You're having fun with data, aren't you? Oh, we have a lot of fun with data. We have a fun with We have a great <laughs> team. We have a great team. Well, last question yeah. uh, from me, Philip, is um, any advice that you would give to, to fellow practitioners or things that you would do, do differently if you had to do it over again? I think simple is underrated. <laughs> um, I've seen very complicated uh, you know, models that blow me away from their design and complexity and just the, the, the scientific acumen needed to build that model. And I've seen it presented in front of uh, the people who will have to make a difference with this model and they don't understand it. And so that effort, all that passion, the, all that intellectual capital wasn't used. It, it just lay on the shelf and over time It'll, it'll probably unfortunately disappear. And I think simple uh, is you need to do this differently. Mm -hmm. And so that question, the answer, that structure uh, of approaching every problem as if it were that simple question and answer is really the, the key thing that I would recommend to a, a lot of scientists. Yeah, so if they, don't, if they don't understand it, they don't trust it, if they don't trust it, they can't act on it. Absolutely. All right, Philip Kim, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It was great to have you. I appreciate it, pleasure being here. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We have uh, Simon Zhang coming up here. If you want to know the secret behind LinkedIn's sales growth, pay attention to this next segment. Uh, Simon is a data scientist at LinkedIn, former neurosurgeon turned data scientist. So pretty interesting segment coming up. This is theCUBE. I'm Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. We'll be right back after this message.